Welcome to Self Helpful. I'm your guide, Kevin Miller, and I curate the sea of new personal development messages to bring the most influential leaders onto this show. Join me as I question my guests to better understand their counsel so we can all integrate the wisdom into our lives because we all want to elevate our own experience and improve the way we show up for others. The Self-Helpful Podcast is presented by Ziggler, your premier source for equipping coaches. Visit Ziggler.com. Hello, self-helpful listeners. In this episode, what drives Terry Cole? Terry is my expert on boundaries from the previous episode and the message from her new book, Boundary Boss, The Essential Guide to Talk True, Be Seen, and Finally Live Free. That's our muse for this series on boundaries. And this episode, however, is where I walk through the seven key areas of life and ask Terry about her values and motives and her daily habits around them. And as you can imagine, we come back over and over to the topic of boundaries and how Terry works to integrate what she preaches and teaches into the everyday practices of her own life. Uh, along with her book, Boundary Boss, you can check Terry out at her really popular podcast, The Terry Cole Show. Um, all right, this is Terry Cole, and this is part two. Well, Terry, I'm eager to hear on some of these of the the things that drive you. I know uh, some about you, but I'm about to learn more. So we start off here and the first one is spiritual. We talked about that a little bit at the top of the last show, spirituality and and some of the downsides of religion as they Mm. uh, affect our boundaries, I think, culturally. But to start off on a spiritual level, tell me what drives you here uh, and, and what you value. I really value nature, and that's very um, connected to my spirituality, is spending time in nature, and I'm a big animal lover, and um, I care about the ecology, I care, you know, I care care about what's happening (laughs) in the world, but spending time outside, so I mean, specifically, my husband and I moved 20 years ago to the middle of nowhere in upstate New York, we live on three acres in the woods, very close, like just, I feel like I'm snuggled up against nature all the time intentionally, like just in a hug with nature. And that really is my spirituality, although I believe in um, a God. I, I believe in something greater, some divine intelligence. I don't know exactly what it is. And I grew up um, going to Sunday school, but I grew up Protestant, which is like, it's not like growing up Catholic or Episcopalian. It's, it's not hardcore, you know, they're like, okay, you could believe that if you want. Like it, it's, it's sort of like religion light. I was just more yeah, like, I was gonna say Catholic light. <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah. more like a community type of thing. So I've, I've always been a very community oriented person from, and I think part of it is growing up in a church and having parents from small towns where I'm not kidding, true story, side note, when I lived in New York City, when I was like straight out of college, I just moved to New York. If somebody new would move into my, on my floor, I would make them a casserole and give them it it, with my dish, with my name on the bottom, like you do at church things. How churchy of you, exactly. My boss was like, he was such a hardened New Yorker from Long Island. He was like, Sarah, nobody's eating food you give them they don't even know you you could be poisoning them (laughs) it's like uh, that's really nice (laughs) from a consistent you know like a a habit aspect is there something that you do from a a habitual aspect to, to kind of walk out your spirituality or engage in it or is it by proxy of living where you do you just are kind of consistently immersed in it no i i meditate every day so That is part of my spirituality as well, because it's, you know, it's like connecting to sort of the, I don't know, the unified field, whatever you want to call it. Um, That's part of it. But also working out and being outside every day is part of it, too. So that is before I do anything, before I pick up a phone, before I get in touch with my team, before I do anything, 
I wake up, I have coffee, I meditate. Well, I meditate, then I have coffee. I work out, <clears throat> I do stuff with my husband, take care of the chickens, take care of the geese. Like I have a whole outdoor life that needs me to do things. I mean, my husband, trust me, does most of the crappy work, but but we do it together because this is what we wanted to do. So I feel like that institutionalizes my schedule to being outside every day. Yeah. Do you find yourself in your, you know, in, in, in therapy and working with folks is spirituality. Does that become a part of the conversation often? I'm always curious about that. I mean, it does, but as a therapist, you have to be mindful that you're not, um, sort of shoving your beliefs onto other people because what I believe spiritually isn't their concern, you know? If they're asking me, that's a different story. We can have a conversation. Um, some therapists wouldn't even do that, right? They'd want to know, why do you want to know? And what does that mean to you? And what does it mean to you if I believe? And what does it mean to you if I don't believe? Um, there's lots of different ways of going about it. But I think that people um, certainly struggle with their own relationship to their own spirituality, especially in young, you know, in the beginning of my practice, I had a million people in their 20s. And that's a time when, you're really sort of seeking, like just, yeah. just longing to have a deeper understanding of how it is, quote unquote, like how the world is, what happens after this? Is there more than this? Those types of big questions. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just I tend to be curious about that when in regards to spirituality, as you said, when it's attached to even at the base level of just something beyond self. Mm -hmm. And because without that, uh I wonder how that feeds into the the, the di diseases of despair aspect, the apathy and the feeling alone and isolated when it's just on you. And mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it's always a curious aspect in regards to therapy. And, you know, and another one that speaking of diseases of despair is the next category is relationships and how important those are and how people tend to be more isolated these days than ever. But I'll ask you on a personal level. Yeah. When you look at relationships, what is it that derives you relationally uh, as you look at your boundaries with people and your uh, interactions with folks? Um, I would say I have a vast capacity to love. Hmm. I have a lot of people in my life who really matter to me. I am, I'm a group gal. I love groups. I have the same friends I've had since Nixon was in office, and I'm not kidding. Um, so I literally have the same There's seven of us that I've had since I was four years old. And we're actually active friends. We vacation together. We're friends, right? Our kids are now having kids. It's like, but then I have three older sisters and so the, and my mother. And so that was also a group unit. Then I have my New York friends that I made over the many years. Then I have upstate friends. Then I have couple friends. Then I have... All of like to me, I am endlessly interested in human beings. I love my human connections are incredibly important to me. And it's funny, before I got married, I never thought I was going to get married. Like I wasn't that interested in getting married because my parents got divorced when I was 13. You know, I was like, oh, it looks kind of meh. Like who needs to do it? I could probably do better than that by myself. And I had different partners over the years who... I felt like wanted me to be different than I was. Didn't like that I loved so many people. Didn't like that I was loud or that I cursed or whatever, whatever the thing is. And it's like, I remember after meeting my husband, Victor, how I was like, felt like I could really be myself. Mm -hmm. Like that he was not, he was such a good sharer of me with others. Mm -hmm. He was like, never trying to make me not spend time with my girlfriends, never, just, I don't know. I, I just found the right person to get married. I've been happily married for 25 years, but I really didn't think it was going to happen. But that was an important thing that someone let me prioritize my relationships with other people, as well as prioritizing my relationship with him, of course. Okay. So you, I hear the desire to be connected with people. How does that, what does that look like on a given day or a week? Because what you just talked about having the same friend since four years old, that has got to be one of the most unique things ever these days. I, I appreciate the song by Ben Rector. Uh, you can't make old friends. 
And <laughs> I, I look at that. I think most people, it's kind of a lament though, because even that, mm-hmm. if I look at my childhood friends, uh, gosh, at this point, my literal, like back to school, I got one that I'm still in mm-hmm. contact with. We don't have that anyway. So what do you do? What have you done then habitually to foster that? Well, we, uh, through the years when we were all raising younger kids, we would do at least, and uh, there was a, a but probably four of us were, were more close, meaning we would we would be on a, a text thread. Now all of us are on a text thread where we're literally texting every single day. But through the years when the kids were younger, because this was, you know, we're talking about the 90s into the early 2000s, um, we would always have, uh, we would call it the Maywood 8, that's what we used to be called. Anyway, get together. So we would always do an annual barbecue. So mm-hmm. whoever, and then every life event. So having kids, there would be the baby showers that like we, we always celebrated each other's graduating from this, getting your master's, getting your PhD, whatever it is you're doing. Like it, those things we always continued to still celebrate with each other, but also going away. Once we hit 40, we were like, okay, now we got to start traveling together on big birthdays. Like kids are not five anymore. It's time. And we've been doing that, which has been great. Like we did it at 40. We did it at uh, 45, we did it at 50. So, but it's staying as we age, there is something about for me having people in my life who've known me all of my life, not just my family, cause they've known me all of my life, my family of origin. It's, there's something that is so heartwarming about having this much history with people. So what's required is you put in an effort. Someone, someone's parent dies, get in my car and drive five hours. And you, you are required. People will sometimes say to me, you're so lucky. You have all of these beautiful relationships. And I'm like, dude, that it is not luck. That is intention. That is me being willing to do, to go above and beyond, to do what it takes to maintain a friendship. Remember what people talk about care. Someone's mother is not doing well, calling them and being like, hey, what happened at the doctor? Remembering what, and that is emotional labor. That takes time, energy, and effort. But for me, it's very natural to do it for a lot of people. Okay, natural. But I I mean, you know, if I look at the aspect of that, to be intentional, to make that investment, that's, I'm not that way. I mean, what you're talking Mm -hmm. about, I, I am not. I tend to isolate, I can do solitary. And so I have to look at it and go, look, there's a value here but I'm going to have to make that investment. So I hear that the investment's not hard for you to do. It's not something you have to make a big effort, but you are doing it and you're doing it. What I heard is you're doing it in the, I don't want to say smaller ways, but kind of the quantity way. So eh, there's a text thread we stay, but then you also have these big events as, as well. And I don't, I'm not trying to get you to choose from them, but I'm looking for the value of just your own experience. Where do you find, if you had to choose one or the other, is it the consistent communications or is it that, no, I'd, if I had to only pick one, it would be the big, ga- you know, the, the important gathering where we're literally together face to face, having a shared experience, shared context. It's interesting. I couldn't pick and I will not because they're okay. both just as important. Okay. What, what I want to say though, about what's in it, right? What's in it for me? is, and it makes sense to me that from what you shared earlier about sort of not wanting to burden others to a degree or not wanting to uh, other people to auto advice, give you or whatever, if you're going through something is that being vulnerable with people who are emotionally trustworthy, there's nothing that feels Mm -hmm. as good as that, where you don't have to have the answers where you can just be like, I messed up. I feel I'm ashamed. I did this thing and I feel so bad about it. It was the wrong thing and I can't, I don't know how to undo it. And having people who just love you anyway. And they're like, I did something similar, trying to make you feel better or whatever. Like just knowing that there's literally nothing. You said the word, you said the word heartwarming. Uh, to have those people. And and I wrote down the word I was going to ask you, is, is, would you put it in a aspect of even like grounding? Mm. Yes. I mean, my oldest friends certainly are grounding, but being loved unconditionally, feeling accepted unconditionally, right? I look at my relationship with my husband, which is 
the most important relationship in my life, without a doubt. I feel totally free and securely tethered simultaneously in that relationship. Okay. Uh, let me ask you on that then. I had Laura Tremaine on my show and I was just on her show. She has the book Life Council, which is actually, a, it's like the 10 friends every woman needs. Uh, but it was you know, to me just the friends that you need. And it was interesting with her as she said, just what, well, you didn't say this, but she said her, her, her husband is her most important relationship, which you just said, but she said, he's not my best friend. She says, I I've had a best friend or two or whatever for, for a long time. And she like you has these long standing relationships. And that's to me is almost like a blasphemous statement. But I thought about, I talked, I literally talked about it with my wife this past week. Mm -hmm. You know, are we supposed to be our each other's soulmates and best friends and everything? Or man, I've got a lot of relationships that fill things. And there's a lot of stuff. She, there's no way she can fulfill because she has no experience being a father, a man, uh, you know, yada, yada. Yeah. And so I, I, I hear some of that flavor from you. Yes. And I love that not having all that pressure on one relationship. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my, he doesn't have to be all of those things, but he's everything that I want in a partner. Yeah. And he is, he is a best friend to me. Like, but I know what she's saying because as women, we, we've mastered the art of best friendships. This is, we are into this from the earliest ages. We are literally choosing who's going to be our best friend. It's like precursor to going out with someone, even though, even for straight girls, do you know what I mean? Where we are partnering up, we are picking our person. We are, there's something about that, that I feel like is pretty, uh, heterosexual female. Yeah. All female, probably. The next category is health and wellness. Tell mm -hmm. me what, uh, you talked about working out and what, it, but what drives that effort for you to be healthy and well? You know, I think having a cancer diagnosis in my early thirties, it became like this wake up call where all of my working out, I always was physically pretty physically fit. I always was coordinated. I was a cheerleader all of my life through college and whatever, but it was all for certainly going to the gym in New York City once I moved here and was Italian age and all. It was all about the size of my ass. It was all about how I looked. It was all about the mm, the the aesthetics. And getting have getting sick and getting better, thank God, really changed that. Like at a young age it was such a valuable lesson to get that you know what is not guaranteed to you? Your health. That's not guaranteed. I thought, what? How do I have cancer? I've been a vegetarian for 10 years. Like, what are you kidding me? Like, I was so mad. <laughs> I felt very unjustly chosen by God. And yet what I learned is that, A, my job is to be my own medical advocate. There are bad doctors just like there's bad other people. Yeah. So don't be looking at all doctors like they're all holier than something because they're not. But my... I, I get now from that moment forward, which was decades ago, that my health is not guaranteed. So it's a luxury. I get to jump on my trampoline, lift weights, hike, go out, you know, do, do all the things that I get to do in my life. That is a privilege that not everyone gets to do. Yeah. So I definitely don't look at working out as something I have to do. I definitely look at it as something I get to do. I, I'm with you with the, per, I actually have a friend who's dealt with chronic pain and, uh, for years and she didn't call me out, but she said, dude, I want you to realize your privilege to, to enjoy the health and vitality that you have. Cause yes. not everybody has that. And I, I do want to pull out, you mentioned a trampoline. So mm -hmm. you as a, you as a grown up yeah. on a trampoline, that's, Excellent. I, that's so rare. Um, but we actually but it's got a mini, it's a mini trampoline. It's like an actual workout yeah. where it's incredible for your cardiovascular, great for your joints as you age. So it doesn't kill them as much. I love it. I found this during the pandemic because mm. I couldn't go to the gym. I used to do Zumba all the time and I did other classes as well, but I was more of, a, I always want like to move and dancing and that type of a thing. And this fulfills all the things. I found this woman online mm. who is amazing. Her name is Michelle Brailer. If anyone cares, she has her own YouTube channel. It's free, a million workouts. And 
I was in such denial. It was like, obviously they're going to be opening the gym any minute. And then two months went by and I was like, yeah. Oh my God. Like I have to become a person who works out at home. And now the gym's been open for a year and I have not been back. <laughs> I, well, I pulled out the trampoline. We got one eons ago w- with kids, but really with my, uh, my oldest son who had some, uh, he had a brain hemorrhage as a baby mm-hmm. and, uh, uh, ultimately ended up with, uh, epileptic and we got one for his cognitive training and just balance and things like that. Well, we're on our, I don't know, fourth family train. We always have one. We actually built yeah. our, built our deck so that you can step out right onto the trampoline and we do that. I love the body. It's just a full body workout and the mm-hmm. balance, which then helps you cognitively. So when you said that, I, I wanted to pull that out. That's great. Now you also mentioned that you had been, had been or are, uh, did you say vegan or vegetarian? Vegetarian. Okay. So um, that's, that has been, is that kind of your nutritional dietary structure? No, no, no. I stopped after I married my husband because his mother was still alive and she was teaching me how to cook Hungarian. And it was like, there was nothing we could cook that didn't have meat in it. And she would always be like, Teddy, Teddy, taste it. I'm like, Oh God, I can't, it's more, more freaking bacon. But now I, I mostly eat veg. I'm more pescatarian. That's what I always was. And I'm still more that I don't love like meat, meat, but none of it is a religion for me at this point in my life. What are the dietary vices that you enjoy? And a lot of people don't like that I call it vices, but I just do. But, you know, those indulgences, whatever you want to call it. What's what's on your list? Uh, well, it's summer now. Mm-hmm. So I really love some soft serve ice cream. And we have a great place near us. So I love that. Um, what else? I got to say, we eat really pretty well. Honestly, like I like eating well. But if my downfall, if there were to be any, would probably be more sweets than anything else. Yeah. Because if somebody made like homemade dessert every day, I'd want to eat it. I mean, I wouldn't because then <laughs> then all my jumping on the trampoline would be for nothing. But <laughs> fair, fair. That's that's uh, my indulgence. Ice cream. Well, and you said your mother, mother-in-law, Hungarian. Um, I, I worked at a Hungarian restaurant as a youth. Mm-hmm. That's, that's some heavy food. That's just, Oh, my God. Broca Kapasta. Oh, my yes. God. It's like. Yes. <laughs> so many things. I serve that stuff. But that was, that's hardcore. All right. Uh, next one is mind and mental health. I mean, this is mm-hmm. the area of your, of, of you, your vocation, but, uh, even like mental state, I'm always curious about that and looking at what is the, you know, what do you, what drives you in the mental, st- you know, for the mental state that you want to have. And you did talk, uh, multiple times already about meditation, about mm-hmm. pursuing that, uh, as a habit. But when you look at yourself, what is your, you know, your, your muse of this is what I'm trying to achieve mentally. Well, mentally, I want to be healthy. That that's my goal. I've been in therapy on and off, but, but mostly on for over 30 years for sure. So I'm, I'm always curious. I'm radically curious about my own mind, about what I'm doing, about what's driving my behaviors, which is why I loved, I love the name of your book, What Drives You. Thank you. Um, Because it is one of the things I'm always questioning as a psychotherapist and for myself as to what is driving my behavior. So I think probably for my mental wellness, the thing that drives it the most is my ability to be profoundly grateful a lot, like a lot about everything. And maybe that had to do with being sick when I was younger. I think I was like this long before I had cancer though, that I had the ability to really be grateful and to see that not everyone had the, the opportunities that I've had. And not my mother used to always say things like, and it's so funny because my husband is the same way. She would be like, you know, we are, I'm so grateful that we have hot water in the house. Hmm. You know, there are people all over the world who don't even have clean water, Tara. Now, she, I didn't take that as she was trying to make me feel bad. She was trying to make me be grateful hmm. for what's right. And it's so funny. My husband is exactly the same way in, in the way of thinking of, because he's first generation American, always thinking about the underdog and other people having it worse and what's happening in, in other countries. And, you know, growing up in New Jersey, I was like, you know, me, the universe, you know, New Jersey, the universe revolves around it. And I learned so much about 
that. So anyway, long way around the barn to get back to my mental status is very connected to my ability to be grateful, but also to use therapy and EMDR and other modalities and self-help to continue to be curious about how I'm doing and is there anything I need to change and what's not working, you know? Well, I mean, I, it's so hard to not, this is a self-helpful show. You know, these are the topics mm-hmm. that we talk about that self-awareness seems to always be at the top of the list. Going back to our first discussion together and your meditation, helping you achieve, as you said, a, a one or two second pause increase you know, before just the reaction. And to me, to be self-aware, that's what I, that's, that would be like the magic wish answer one of those please help me be self-aware before i respond no no no, before i react to anything just to understand myself to be aware where where do you now on the other side of this question where do you where is terry cole most at risk where do you have to take affirmative action Mm -hmm. for your own mental health Well, I stopped drinking when I was in my early 20s. So there's always a certain amount of um, hypervigilance around drinking drugs, any anything that could veer me off this this path, because you know, then, then anything you put above your sobriety when you're sober, you lose, right? I mean, that's just how it goes. So there's a certain amount of that, right? There's a vulnerability there. I think that your nature, and I think we were saying this in one of our other conversations we've had in the last two days, but my nature, the codependency, the um, being attuned to other folks, I'm way healthier, meaning I've got way better boundaries and I zip myself up energetically. I, I do a lot of energy work actually to protect myself because where I'm vulnerable is other people's pain other people's problems. I mean, I chose the perfect line of work, right? To do what I do as a high functioning codependent, <laughs> to, to be able to do what it's called. It's actually um, one, a psychological defense mechanism called sublimation, where you take the thing that could be a bad thing. So like a, someone who has a little bit of a leaning towards um, giving pain to people, and then they become an orthodontist. Mm. Right. And then so they get to fulfill that little need without becoming like a serial killer. So, <laughs> wow. Okay. I thought about that. That's interesting. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So sublimation is my point is I, I, it's OK for me to do this for business, to talk about it, jobs, people, courses. Right. I'm, I'm in a position to do it where I'm vulnerable is in my life still. Mm. So I'm very aware of not overstepping. I'm very aware of letting the chips fall where they may when they're not my chips. You mentioned energy work. Tell me just a little bit about that, the energy work that you do. I do a daily energy routine that one of my one of my best friends is actually a brilliant energy worker, healer, coach, I guess you'd call her. Her name is Lara Riggio. And she has a daily thing where you're zipping up your energy, you're moving energy. She's helped me so much in my life. And we've shared clients for 20 years, probably at this point, where, you know, with talk therapy, there's only so much, you know, sometimes you get to a point and there's just issues in the tissues that the talking are probably not going to get to. Mm. And then I know they need to go see Lara because she can help move it out of the tissues and teach them to do it themselves. When you're an empath or a highly sensitive person, it's really important that you know how to clear your energy. So I protect my energy. I do an energy, an aura weaving thing every day. And I do this other thing where I zip up, you go up the center meridian three times and you sort of lock it in here. So we're, it, it's like a certain amount of protecting your energy from energy vampires, which doesn't mean you're being closed down to everyone. It just means that some people think you have what they need, hmm. but you don't. So when your energy is zipped up, and you don't have a bunch of holes in your aura, those people don't really see you as viable, you know? Um, So that, that's what I do energy work. And I also clear my energy after I've seen clients or whatever. So with a bath, there's different, it's like a witch's brew that I do in the bathtub that helps 
clear energy with like lemons and essential oil and vinegar and all kinds of things. I, I think I'm going I'm to ask you just because you're on the topic um, that you know, for a lot of people, including me, who I'm, you know, familiar with the concept. I mean, I do believe that we are, yeah, we are, uh, energy is, is the key there, but on actually addressing it is not the norm. Do you have a, any kind of a resource at all that you would yeah. recommend for anyone who says, Oh, I'm interested. Just like if somebody says, oh, I'm interested in psychedelics or whatever. Okay. Well, here's a resource yeah. to kind of start like the one one. what would you do for energy? I would go to lararigio.com. It's L A R A. Yep. R I G G I O dot com because she has okay. tons of free little videos for everything from I've got jet lag help to I can't sleep to I'm anxious to I mean she really covers the gamut and it's super helpful stuff that you can do in like two minutes because okay. you know what nobody's you know no, nobody's doing more than that but two to three minutes yeah I can do that uh, next category is work, career, business, uh, vocation. Mm -hmm. What drives you there? Though I, I, I had this waiting to pull this in because mm -hmm. you lead off your book with, with this, this, uh, of what drove you. Uh, you said that you were, uh, the disappointment that you were to, to your thought you were to your father for not mm -hmm. being a son. You're the fourth daughter or third, mm -hmm. fourth daughter, fourth daughter. So last and the last one, and you were not mm -hmm. the son. So uh, thought you were a disappointment. Said so much of your adult ambition was driven by a hidden compulsion to prove myself worthy, which means it wasn't a conscious choice. The direction that you went, the drive that you had, okay, you know, in this, well, you didn't say vocationally, I'm pulling it in on this section, but you said, you know, for your life, whatever, was to prove yourself uh, worthy. And you said later on as a, uh, your mother refuted that. She, you know, said mm -hmm. that whether but she, that's not true. He didn't, you know, wish that you were a boy. But anyways, that's a story you had written at least, and that was a primary drive uh, for you. How did you work your way out of that one? Well, in therapy, I realized through with the help of this amazing therapist Bev that my ambition was too much. That that there was something painful driving the drive, <laughs> right? It, it wasn't just, oh, I, I really want to be running a talent agent representing supermodels, right? That wasn't the drive. It was to be successful and make a lot of money. That was the drive because that would that was the thing my father valued. So when I got to that point where I was running an agency and making a ton of money and representing Naomi Campbell, I was like, wow, here I am. And I still don't feel the way I want to feel like it. I was chasing a feeling, but I was really running away from a feeling. And through the therapeutic process, while I was climbing this Hollywood ladder, so to speak, I was, you know, uncovering all of this stuff in my own therapy around what I was really doing. And I got to a point where I just realized I am so lit up about how therapy can help people change their lives and how it changed. I changed my own life from what I learned about myself in therapy that I don't care about the Pantene deal or the movie contract. And even at the end of my career as a talent agent, I was, I couldn't deny that. What was I really doing? Getting people in eating disorder clinics, drug treatment clinics, getting people in therapy like that was what my drive was. I no longer cared about all the superficial crap. So I knew I needed to leave. And when I was leaving that business, I was like, I'm going to go to school to become a therapist. Nobody understood. People were like, wait a minute, you're going to leave this amazing career. Keep in mind, it was the nineties when supermodels were it. Right. George Michael, the freedom video. Like I represented all those people. Like this was massive to say I'm leaving this shiny, sparkly, sexy career to become a social worker, basically. Nobody really got it, but I didn't care because it was at that point. At the age of 30? Is that what I... I was like, no, I was older. 32, maybe? 33? Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, talk about a countercultural move to be at the top of that. But I that's why I pulled it out because... 
of the, you know, I talk about that in my book, The Hidden Drive, that that's what I had that mm-hmm. sabotaged me over and over. It's, the, it's, it's why my bio has 19 businesses. It's supposed to sound impressive, but re- what it really says is, oh, so you didn't know what the heck you were doing or going after <laughs> and you built them, they succeeded, then you sabotaged them because of that hidden yeah. drive. That, there you are. And if you had not found it, that's what I'm interested in too. Play that out. Mm-hmm. You know, what's the propensity of what would have happened to you on a soul level if you had stayed in there? So, well, this is what I this is what I do and never become aware of what was really driving you that would have managed. I would be I'd be a different person, though. Like I also was a person who my happiness was also very important to me. And for a long time in my career in entertainment as an agent, I was happy. I was fulfilled because I was I was growing in strides. I was accomplishing something. I was making relationships. I was negotiating multi-million dollar contracts. Like I was doing things that, where I could be like, check that box. As I got healthier and as sort of my, my values changed mm-hmm. in a way is when it became less satisfying to the point that I was like, I'd rather leave now. I've had a great run and give this a try because, you know, honestly, Kevin, I knew I, I'm one thing I know how to do is work. And I was like, whatever it takes to be successful as a therapist, right. I will do that. And then I did that for many years. Then I was like, oh, now I'm going to have a public platform. Oh, now 2015, I'm going to have a podcast. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to have courses. I'm going to do all these things. I feel like, you know, that yoga saying, how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm-hmm. I don't agree with that when it comes to everything, but I feel like if you're willing to work, and I've always been willing to work, I knew I'd figure it out. So I wasn't afraid of like, you know, people are like, how are you going back to square one after all of this success? And it's not like I had a lot of money saved. I didn't. I spent all my money traveling, doing whatever the hell I wanted. So you know, people are like, oh, you had a lot of money in the bank? I was like, no, I literally had $900 in the bank. That's exactly how much money I had in the bank when I quit my job. <laughs> and I was like, I guess I'm going to figure it out, which I did. I'm going to ask you on the drive aspect now. So now you are here. So now, now you're here where you are today. Uh, you've been successful, you know, as a therapist, you uh, decided to write a book. Uh, as mm-hmm. we talked about, you and I are both first time authors. So this book is your first one. Explain that in the reference of this is what's driving you now. Well, what's driving me since I had a public platform since, so maybe that's 2008, 9, 10, whatever. But the first time I actually had a decent website was 2011, probably. My drive has been to reach more people. My drive is to serve more people. As many people around the world as I possibly can help, teach them how to lessen their own suffering and elevate their own joy. Because I know that there are things that they can do to do that, no matter what their circumstance is. So what drove me to do a book was that the same thing that drove me to not have a one-on-one practice in the same way that I used to, and to really pour myself into a public platform and a podcast, it was all about the reach. I could reach the woman in India, in Serbia. I mean, I have people all over the world, who Egypt, people who get in touch with me, being like, my husband does not know that I listen to you, <laughs> but your podcast changed my life, like honestly. Wow. So the drive, I think, for what I'm doing now, honestly, is to help as many people as possible. I did a whole campaign to get Boundary Boss in libraries around the country because it's not just about who can afford a book. The reason I put out so much free content is because I want to even the playing field a little bit. Like everybody deserves access to mental wellness, Hmm. to strategies that will help them be more mentally well. Okay. Well, what a great lead into money, uh, Mm -hmm. finances, wealth, even, even possessions. When you look at that and if money in its, in and of itself was a drive, you would have, you know, maybe stayed as a a talent agent, but it sounds like obviously you've done well since then in this, but when you, again, when you look at that, when you look today, money, finances, and wealth, uh, what is, well, I'll ask, I'll ask since you've had some changes like that, you know, what drives you now and how, how, if and how that's changed. I never was great with money. I always knew how to make it. I never really know how to hang on to it. 
even even as a talent agent, I was worked for a long time and didn't have a lot to show for it other than a lot of really amazing experiences. So I think what's changed is that once I became more grown up, once my husband and I got together, we both had really messed up money karma, like sure. just just getting screwed over by people literally have a terrible story. I won't even tell it, but our entire retirement, we got defrauded of this was in 2012, I guess. Sadly, it was the best man in our wedding who defrauded us. Oh my God. So painful. And that's not, that's not the only story like that. That's in our past together. So I was like, okay, we got to do some healing on this money stuff. And through therapy, we have, he has, I have understanding he's first generation American. Imagine if all your relatives were like taken into war camps and like, there's reasons why holding on to wealth would make you feel unconsciously bad. Right. Um, and I've got all my own stuff. So working through that and being a grown up around money, I mean, it's only happened in the last 10 years, I'd have to be honest, but is something that is creating more, has created for us more freedom. So I look at money as liberation. I'm not a, I don't want a Hummer. I'm, I'm not like a, a thing girl. Like I don't like things. I have the same, you know, people like get engaged and then after they have kids, they're like, I'm going to get a different ring. I'm like, I love my, I would never get another ring in my life. Like I love the ring I have. I've had it for 25 years. Like what's wrong with this diamond? Nothing. Anyway, things are not my thing, so to speak. Experiences are definitely my thing, but security as well. So what was most, what drove me the most around making money I said, my husband is a very well-known political artist. He goes into war zones and does on the spot journal, like a visual journalism. He's so talented. He's so amazing, but he's worked like a beast. He, he was widowed when his wife was, you know, he was 29 with a five, three and a one-year-old when he was widowed. I came in 12 years later. So you can imagine it was still kind of a mess, but this guy has worked a lot. And so my a big driving force for me is that I want to make all the money in the world so that he can only do what he wants. Mm -hmm. He We have geese and chickens and big organic gardens that he loves, and he does almost all of that stuff. So a driver for me was creating enough income so he could stop taking jobs he didn't want to take, like no more HMO magazines. They suck. You're not interested. You're not inspired. So anyway, I think I answered the question, did I? Uh, yeah, no, it's I, I, I appreciate it. I am also just laughing because you said you had your same wedding ring. I'm, we just had our 30th anniversary and this is the <laughs> ring we bought from service merchandise. Uh, yes. 60 had a buddy that who worked there for 60 bucks. Cause I thought, Oh dude, just, just buy something cheap. I'm going to lose it at some point. Well, <laughs> 30 years later, I'm still wearing this. And, uh, yeah, so I'm with it. you. I'm with you. No, I, I appreciate that so much. Well, the last one here. Terry is just on the personal, and you mentioned some of it, but the personal interests. I'm always interested in those things, the things that you do just for you, for your mm -hmm. own inspiration, your joy, your fun, your play, that they may not in and of themselves be a productive venture. This is something you yep. do to just light yourself up. Tell me about that. Well, um, I love Hollywood gossip and People Magazine, and I read all the trades still. Right. I was in that world. So I love you can variety. Go, I worked at that person. I knew them. I remember yep. that. Yeah. And I'm also so interested in what's happening in the landscape. Like I'm so I always still have one little foot in there because I've also worked with a lot of high profile actors and singers and di different people. So that keeps me in the world, too. Yeah. But that's something that, you know, my husband would <laughs> he always he'll pick up the mail and he'll be like, oh, my God, I was so worried, but I'm so relieved because Jennifer Aniston and he'll like, tell me whatever the cover is. Like he's <laughs> always just busting my chops that I'm reading. Cause you know, he's Mr. Let's watch another historical freaking movie about world war two. You know what I mean? Where I'm like, you know what? Shut up, pal. Sometimes <laughs> you just need to read people magazine. Yeah. So that's one thing I'm interested in. Um, I'm interested in um, yoga and stuff like that in learning more about it, I'm really interested in physical wellness. So I just interviewed someone, she's an expert on the fascia in the physical body mm -hmm. and how you can uh, take better care of your fascia, right? The connective tissue mm -hmm. and what, like I'm super interested in that, those types of things. 
physical wellness in a real way and different sort of cutting edge things that people are doing. Not necessarily Dave Asprey. I want to live to be 180. I just want to have good quality of life while I'm alive. All right. And of course you live out in the woods and you've mentioned all the animals. So I assume that's something you do more than just growing your own food. Yeah, we grow our own food um, and we have our own eggs and really it's just for the love. Like it's my, my husband comes from a long line of farmers on both sides of his, his Hungarian and German roots. And he's compelled. Like there is nothing that it didn't matter where he lived. I mean, when I met him, he was in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and still somehow had grapevines in his backyard that were thriving. Like, yeah. I feel like there's a DNA thing. And so I just decided, um, if you can't beat him, might as well join him as well because jump. it brings him joy. You yeah. know, and he wanted these animals. Most people learned how to like make bread during the pandemic. Somehow I got sucked into being on crackpot farm, as we call it. Like, <laughs> how do I have chickens and geese? That's what I want to know. Beautiful. <laughs> Terry, thank you. It's just such a joy. Uh, it's fun to hear the behind the scenes on your life, the things that uh, drive you. That's such an interest of mine, obviously. Well, I wrote a book <laughs> about it, but thanks for being here. It's uh, It's been a blast to get to know you, to talk with you. I look forward to more conversations like this. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Kev. I loved it. All right, friends. Again, Terry Cole's book is Boundary Boss, The Essential Guide to Talk True, Be Seen, and Finally Live Free. And her popular podcast is The Terry Cole Show. Coming up next in this series on boundaries, I talk with Broadway and film star Renee Marino about this idea of boundaries. And like me, she historically has not had boundaries in her life, and she's working to engage with them today in her life today. And our discussion brings forth some really interesting new highlights and perspectives for walking out boundaries in our own lives. Friends, thank you for tuning into Self Helpful, where I curate the sea of new personal development materials and help you integrate wisdom into your life because we all want to elevate our own experience and improve the way we show up for others. 